uh, wasn't much of a discovery was it because it was laying open in the Bible, but the Book of Enoch was discovered in 1773 by a gentleman named Bruce, a Scotsman, who was traveling in Ethiopia at the time. Well, it's kind of a continuation of the story, and the more the story continued, the farther out it got, it got very outlandish. So finally you come to the third book of Enoch, which is probably written around 600 A.D., and, and pieces were scattered around here and there. The, the book really didn't exist in its entirety until Professor Oderberg uh, brought all the pieces together in about 1928 and did his work. And he put all these pieces together and compiled the third book of Enoch. The, the books are called Ethiopic and Slavonic and, and uh, Hebrew. Hebrew Enoch because those are the languages it was written in. So uh, there's no question that the second book of Enoch really is just a story. And the third book of Enoch is just um, uh, a story. More than likely, the third book of Enoch influenced something called the Zohar, which is, let's call it, Hebrew mysticism at its highest. Because um, Enoch goes up to heaven, but you can't be in heaven without being a heavenly creature. So he was translated into an angel there. And he became known as the prince of the presence of God. So some people... Uh, that follow that line of thinking have postulated that that might have been the uh, pre-incarnate Christ, but of course that's that's another line of reasoning, not something that a, a, a mainline Christian would uh, would swallow very well. So uh, you have mm, over a hundred names that that Enoch is called when he is translated into the Prince of the Presence of God, and these names are in the book. And supposedly, uh, he left us uh, an alphabet and a way of calling down the angels themselves. Of course, this gets into mysticism and, and some very odd angel um, uh, worship practices, which are far beyond the, the normal Christian belief system. What is the normal Christian belief system with regard to angels that you can speak of? Well, you know, generally speaking, we believe that they were created by God. They are non-corporeal spiritual creatures. Uh, the book of uh, Genesis tells us that the sons of God, that would be angels, came down and bred with the daughters of men and produced what they call the men of renown. And this opens up an entire can of worms because... Who are these men of renown? What did they do? Uh, they are the men of legends. The men that we possibly have our myths about. Uh, Achilles and Hercules and those creatures. But then the book of First Enoch tells us that three types were produced. And um, they were monsters. They did not die. They uh, consumed everything. They were full of rage. And Kim, the, the very odd, odd thing about this story is when you dig into it, the angels fell. They taught us a lot of things that they might not have, uh, uh, they, they shouldn't have taught us, according to this book. Uh, weapons of war, practices of killing, charms, astronomy, astrology, uh, magic, all of these things that they say that the, the book says that they taught us. But it also says that they loved their children. And I find it to be just astounding that the angels did not come down and breed with the women and then flee. They stayed. And the book of Enoch says, I see that you love your children, but you're going to have to see them die. And the bad thing about it is the book tells us that when the body of these beings, these Nephilim, the fallen ones, were killed, their spirits went out into the wilderness. And it says that they plagued men. 
they tormented men. And they were not seen, and they did not get cold, and they did not get hungry, and they were not punished. And they go about causing damage. So it gives rise to the belief that we have in demons. But it's a little twist on the story, because according to this book, one could extrapolate that the demons, the devils that we believe in, in our Christianity, may really not be the fallen angels, but the raging and warlike offspring, those half-corporeal, half-spiritual beings that were produced in, in this ghastly communion between angels and women. Is this what fallen angels, the watchers, and the origins of evil is about? Is this part of the translation of that book? It is. That particular book is nothing more than the history of those beings taken from the book of Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the book of Jasher, and the Bible. And a tiny little book that was found in Qumran called the War Scrolls, which, are you ready for this? I'm ready. One of the fallen angels, his name is Gilgamesh. What does that mean? Gilgamesh was that old Babylonian king that uh, we have our myths about. Um, and he shows up as the name of one of the fallen angels, and he was a Babylonian god king. So we have... Let's call it a cross-pollination of cultures of myth showing up in this tiny little book. Wow. What led you to go into all of this? Have you always been a researcher of the ancient books? I've always been a researcher. I um, spent the last seven years working for the Department of Defense on one of their hypersonic missile technology programs. And that's what I did, but my... My background, my education is in religion. And uh, I was uh, studying for my doctorate and ran across this quote. And when I dug up the translations of the book of Enoch that were out there, I was fairly appalled. that They were, well, let's say this. It, it was fashionable back in that time, back in the early 1900s and late 1800s, to add weight to your writings by taking on an Elizabethan or King James voice to your work. So not only did you have the, the problem of translation of one text, say Ethiopic, to, to English, but you also put on this false weight to it. When I read the, the books that I could find, I was just appalled at how poorly they read. So I set about to create uh, a good, solid, modern English accessible translation with notes. And when I got finished, I thought, well, this is good enough to, uh, to expose other people to. And, and I did, and it took off. It's the best-selling translation in the U.S. at this time. Fallen Angels, The Watchers, and the Origins of Evil? No, the, the translations that we did for Enoch. And uh, Fallen Angels is this company's second best uh, seller. You have your own publishing company, too. I would imagine that one would have to self-publish to do this. It was very difficult. I, I tried several houses. They didn't want to touch it. It was too uh, um, controversial, too provocative. And uh, so... I, I knew enough to, to get it off the ground, and, and uh, we signed with uh, Ingram, which is a very large distributor, and uh, we went on from there. That's awesome. In our first conversation, you spoke a little bit about Thomas. Do you remember that? I love the Gospel of Thomas. Talk to us about what excites you about Thomas. There's something you want to share with us about Thomas that's important to you. Thomas... Uh, well, first of all, I think that if Thomas had been available at the time, it probably would have, um, well, I'll put it this way. If, if some of the bishops had read, read Thomas, it may have made it into canon, but there was a lot of controversy. First of all, Thomas really isn't a gospel. Uh, it's a misnomer. A gospel is the, the telling of the good news. Thomas does not tell the good news. Thomas is a little over 100, I think it's 114, had to look at it, maybe 112, 
sayings of Jesus directly.